Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 119. This episode is my new friend Nix, who is easily one of the best people on Twitter.com. If you're not already, make sure you follow him at MC underscore etching. He is an incredibly talented artist, one of the nicest people ever, and just a joy on that website. It's so cool to see his tweets kind of pop up because he's just so supportive. He's always looking out for other people, and he puts out really great stuff. Uh, incredibly talented. Like I said, he uh, he does a lot of glass etching. So he'll etch designs into glass, and oh boy, do we get into that. He breaks down the entire process of how he does all of that. So if you've ever wanted some like nerdy, geeky glassware, stuff like that, Nix is the guy to go to. Uh, we talked about that. We talked about the uh, importance of being yourself. We talk about riding motorcycles, because uh, we both... Uh, have done that. We actually talk about he worked in newspapers, which is what I've been doing for the last almost 11 years. So we talk about just how crazy uh, that career is. The people that you work with. We got some. We got some pretty insane stories. Uh, but then we talk about how he got started etching glass. The process of how exactly he does it. Different pieces that he's done from like super complicated ones to more easy ones. Well. Actually, there's no such thing as easy. We talk about how many times he's cut himself. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Nick's awesome dude. Super nice. Really cool. He's got a giant beard and a purple mohawk. What more do you need? Without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Please enjoy the interesting podcast, episode number 119, with my friend Nick's theme song time. <laughs> Yeah, it seems to be the thing. A lot of people are using Zoom. As we, uh, what is it? We do a, a Friday night Urban Shadows game. Oh, sweet. Uh, game, and that's what we use is Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Has it been around for a while? I feel like I'm just now hearing about it. I, I don't think it's been around that long. Yeah, it's like the it's like the new it's like Skype and Google Hangouts, and then there's Zoom. Is it different from the other two? Um, as far as interface wise, yeah. Um, not really, no. Yeah, it's strange. But hey, but it's working. I, I'm, hearing, it. I'm hearing, I'm hearing, you can get up to forty people in a single call with like with what? the basic, the basic free trial or like the the free account. Dude, can you imagine hurting that many cats? Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> like, hold on, wait. We're gonna do a raise your hand system. <laughs> of who can do this it, I'm glad that this technology exists especially in times that we're in in the moment you know yeah well I was just doing a, a I did a post this morning on Twitter uh, for some reason got me uh, this morning I was got to worrying about people uh, who use uh, recovery and support groups How like I haven't heard oh. a lot about how you know alternate resources yeah. So I um we kind of got a thread going of uh uh online meeting groups and stuff like AANA support yeah. group. Dude, you're like one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter. Just going to say that cuz I don't <laughs> even you. remember how it had to have been some D&D thing that like maybe Critical Role shared something that you were doing and I was like that is an awesome mohawk. I'm going to follow. And then I've been following for like a few months and you're like the greatest, you're one of my favorite people to follow because you have like a positivity about you where you're like, at the very least, I'm going to make the world directly around me better. And it's, I just feel better. I just feel better after reading your tweets. Just letting you know. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been one of those weird trips where it's just like, I don't know. I, it's weird too because I don't do a lot of gaming. Yeah. I'm, I'm very gaming adjacent. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I absolutely outside. love it, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, whenever I get a chance to, I do, I would love to do more, but it's just like, I don't know. I fell in with the, with gaming Twitter and, um, everybody was just so friggin' awesome. And I was at such a bad spot 
Yeah. That I was just just like, oh, 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 people, are, people are cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> was, and I just I felt like I was in a space that was safe enough to like, oh, you can be kind to other people and not get shit on. Yeah, for real. And I was just like, this is what I've been looking for, and I just ran with it. It's so interesting. Like, I just got so I started playing D and D last year. The, no, mm-hmm. like the year before last. And uh, it was something that, like, you know, I always wanted to do growing up, but I just never did. And then I remember I got married. And then all of my groomsmen I've known since high school and everything, I was like, listen, guys, here's the thing. You were at my wedding, so you pretty much have a free pass for the rest of my life. Let's play D&D. So we started playing. <laughs> and, yeah, once you, like, dip your toes into D&D community, it's like this weird thing. It's unlike any other fandom because it's it's almost like we we don't take an ownership of it because it's so collaborative that everyone mm-hmm. has a seat at the table. It's so strange, but like in the best way. It's so cool. Well, that's what I think about uh, tabletop gaming. It, it just in general is just the the collaborative nature of everything. Yeah, and just like you know, for the most part, diversity is it's encouraged, like it's sought after. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's, you know, people want to get out of their own experiences. We're, we're, we're tired of hearing the same stories over and over again. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to hear other things, especially, specifically me is I, I, I love hearing people's stories. Same. I, you know, that's my whole show. Know, just, <laughs> yeah. Just sitting and listening to people just tell their tale of just, and just lives so extremely different from mine. Yeah. You know, you walk away from that enriched. Thousand percent agreed. That's why I started the show, because I love people and I love hearing stories. And, like, there's so many. And what's also fascinating to me is, like, even on another level, people can go through the exact same thing but come out of it with different stuff. And that blows Mm -hmm. my mind. Like, my brother and I, I'm like, we grew up in the same house. We lived through a lot of the same things, but we are very different people because of how we digested all of that. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. wow, people. People are just multifaceted in the strangest ways that you'd never expect. But then we're also all the same. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. Yeah. I love well, it's it. It's just like, you know, I I start I started gaming in the mid 90s. Oh, like sweet. Like I did a, a like a, a little bit of like the World of Darkness stuff, uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse. Uh, nice. Um I I played one game of D&D like 25 years ago. That was my first and only game for 25 years. Really? And then that, yeah, because it's like the group I stumbled into yeah. <laughs> was just, I was like, oh, cool. This is like, I'd love to give this a try. And I sat in and it was like the most just toxic, homophobic, just sexist shit. I, like, I like 20 minutes into it and I literally flipped the table. Like I couldn't take it. Yeah, I bet. And it's just like, and, and I'm I'm still mad at that group because it's just like I was like, oh okay, that's what this is, and I walked away for like 25 years, and I, I missed out on 25 years of gaming because I thought that group of shitheads defined, right? You know, yeah, the experience, a whole. yeah. And it was just like, oh, I, I was I've never been more happy to be wrong in my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet it sucks when that happens. You know, mm-hmm. when, when like, your first experience becomes, like, in our heads, the standard, mm-hmm. you know? So then you're just robbed of that whole thing. Well, I'm glad it, I'm glad it's not still the standard for you, because it's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, it's just, like, and it's one of those things, too, is just, you know, having experienced that, I, you know, I now recognize those behaviors, and it's, you know, trying to help kind of call that out of the community. Yeah. Because it's, it's very much a stigma that's well earned. Right. And, right. Uh, and it's one of those things. It's just like, I'm of that, you know, cisgendered heterosexual white male demographic that I need to turn to my peers and go, look, y'all need to knock this shit off. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's our job. I totally, yeah. I yeah. totally agree. I also like yeah. that. Another thing that I find fascinating about you is like, I love your aesthetic. You've got an amazing beard. Just throwing that out there. I love your purple mohawk. It's like you're so uniquely you, mm-hmm. and I find that so inspiring. But also, you kind of look like a badass, Nick. Just saying it. 
<laughs> so it's like you so you've got this whole thing but you're like the nicest dude ever and i love that like dichotomy of the two sides where you're like oh he's this badass dude but also super nice and inclusive and takes care of everybody else i'm like we need more people like you in the world so i'm glad you exist thank you yep yep you're doing a good it, job it was one of those things it's just this weird look that's kind of been cobbled together I, i've gone through i've posted about it on twitter a lot mm -hmm. um I've gone through a lot of different versions of me. Sure. You know, at one point, I, you know, I was 300 pounds. Wow. You know, yeah. It was for a decade, I shaved my head. Nice. You know, it, I, I, going back through photos of me, like, I'm entirely different people because I was 300 pounds. And then I hit a patch of just, like, severe depression and stuff like that. Sure, sure. I, I just dropped down to 145. Ooh. Yeah. Man, that's and crap. just yeah, and it's just like it, it's it's hilarious over the years. Like I can walk past relatives now, and they have absolutely no idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you're constantly reinventing yourself, which I think inherently makes you more interesting as an individual, because you like you're not afraid to explore those sides of yourself, which I think is cool. I, I like that a lot. It's pretty. Well, neat. That's one of those things. It's you know it's. I, I always tell people I'm a, I, I tend to be a bit of a mimic. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Depending on, on, on who I'm around. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like the people in my life definitely leave an impression on me and inform how I act and how I am going forward. Yep. Um, same. I have, <laughs> you know, physically wise, like I will literally pick up people's ticks. Yeah. <laughs> And it's super hard for me because I feel like I'm I'm making fun of them. Right, it's, right. It's something I have to fight, but it's just like if it, it's it's just one of those things. I, I don't know if it's a tick of my own, but if I see people uh, doing or saying or repeating something in a specific way, I will pick up that pattern the more I'm around you. Yeah, I'm the same. I, I've picked <laughs> up so many mannerisms of my wife over the years. I'm like, oh man, I never Accent. used to do this. Yeah, yeah. Oh lord, <laughs> lord. I thought I was going to get in a fight with a guy <laughs> at an expo I was working at because he was from uh, he was from uh, Minnesota. Oh no, like that, that area and like it, you know, the more I talked to him there, the more I would slip into this here. Yeah, <laughs> and he's just staring at me like, "Are you fucking with me right now?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, definitely not. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, I'm like I have to explain it to people. Like, look, I'm sorry, but I'm. I'm I'm not making fun of you. I literally can't help myself. Yeah, you're like I'm just this way. I'm just this way. <laughs> so what what kind of a kid were you? Were you a nerd? Oh, a huge nerd. Yeah. Oh yeah, comic books, video games. There you go. You know, uh, science fiction, fiction, uh, fantasy novels. Yeah. Just just a huge, huge nerd. Did you have any favorites? Um. See, um, as far as was like writers. Sure. Uh, the classics like Asimov. Yeah. Uh, I fell in love with Piers Anthony as a kid, and then I read him again years later, and I was just like, "Oh shit, dude!" Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much more here. <laughs> or on top of the fact that it's just like, well, you read it, and you're just like, "Oh, oh god, dude, this is like some of the most sexy shit I've ever." Yeah. Oh yeah. I've ever like this is problematic, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, the the bliss of childhood, I'm telling you. Oh yeah. You go back and reread some of that beloved stuff, and you're like, "Oh wow, this is uh -oh. this is really problematic." <laughs> yep, yep. I've learned that the hard way several times. Or like, if something was like really, really good, and then mm -hmm. you revisit it, and you're like, "Oh, oh man, I I'm not gonna make it, guys." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was always a big Frank Herbert fan. Nice, nice. Uh, a huge Dune fanatic. Yeah, there you go. Anything Dune related was it? I remember living in a, a one room studio apartment. Literally, my only two possessions was a tiny cassette player and a copy of Third Eye Blind's first album and a copy of ratty copy of Frank Herbert's Dune. <laughs> and forever, that album is now the soundtrack to Dune. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I I have the same thing where I played I played World of Warcraft for a summer. And they had like, it was like 30% XP rate. So you made 30% more grinding and whatnot. So I capped like four characters in the span of a summer. But I had music playing during the time. 
So whenever I hear a certain song, I just picture myself like jumping on a horse to the beat. And it's <laughs> it's just there. It's just in my head now. They're stuck. Yeah, I think it's I think it's an interesting thing what you're into as a kid and then mm -hmm. growing up later on, especially someone like that's a creative such as yourself, because those sort of loves kinda come out into other things. And we have this community now with the internet and other things like that. It kinda makes the world a little smaller. And yeah. it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. I'm glad we're alive now and not like forty years ago when this wasn't a thing, you know? Well, you know, and that's the thing is just like what was it? I'm 41, so I very much remember pre-internet. Yeah, and uh, I grew up in a, an extremely small town. Really? Um, like the my my school class was 20 some odd kids. Ooh, wow! Yeah, and it's very much one of those those mountain towns where it's like if you do something socially wrong when you're 12, it, it's remembered for all time. Oh yeah. You know, and I wasn't the football kid. Right. And I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't the sports kid at all. I mean, I had the size, but I just, I, you know, wasn't my thing. Right. And it was like I went to a school where the coach was the principal, was, you know. Oh, no. The, the PE teacher, you know. Yeah. And it was, you know, basketball, football was the lifeblood of that town. And it was like, what do you mean you don't play football? Right, right. You know, so, you know, growing What's up that kid. <laughs> You know, overweight, reads comic books, you know, doesn't play sports, you know, very much that stereotypical, like, picked on nerd kid. Yeah, of course. It was, it was, it was rough, and it was one of those things, just like, if I, you know, if you can go back and just be like, just wait until the internet hits, kid. Yeah. It's <laughs> all, all going to change. That's right. It'll be all right. Oh, yep. man. Yep. It's like, one day, we will rule. Just wait. You know, and that's the thing, too, is a lot of those, you know, at least for me and a, a, a bunch of people that I've met, those bullied kids grew up and broke that cycle of bullying. Yeah. Hell yeah. You know, that, that seems to be a real bright spot for me is we didn't grow up to continue that. And, True. You know, I, as a matter of fact, a lot of us grew up and actively fight against that. Yeah. You know, in a very extreme way. As we know, should. Go out, and go out and look for people who are bullies and people who are being bullied and be like, look, you know, like it doesn't have to be like this. Right. It's like we are done with that. Nah. Yeah. I'm into it. I think it's important. I think it's important. But I, I, it's, also, it's also very – it's a crazy thing now that the things that like we were picked on as kids are now cool. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a weird thing to try and like figure out in your head. You're like, wait a second. I was thrown in a trash can for carrying the thing that you're wearing now? Hold on. Yeah. What's I, going I, I on? Always, <laughs> I, I always tell people now, the kids, kids these days. Yeah, kids got these it, days. You got it so easy. You can walk into any department store and just get nerd shirts right off the rack. Yeah. It's like, crazy. I, had to, I, I remember saving up uh, lawn cutting money so there that when go. I went to visit family in Roseville, <laughs> in California, yeah, I could walk to the comic book shop there and get comic book T-shirts, which was just the most mind-bogglingly cool thing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Isn't it funny how it also seems to be a thing with like geeks and nerds? Is like we like to show it, and mm -hmm. like something about wearing a shirt with a thing that you like on it, you're like. It's it does something to like the lizard brain part when we're like, yep, this is the flag, everybody. Like I can't wear mm -hmm. I can't wear a regular shirt. Like I got to wear a shirt with the thing I like on it so people know what I like. Well, it's one of those things too. Is you know way back when when it was harder to get that stuff, that was very much a, an identifier. Yeah, you know for for helping find people that were like you. You know you would you know and you were always on the lookout for somebody wearing some little piece of nerd paraphernalia that you could identify with. Be like, I know that. I get that reference. Yeah. I'm going to go talk to that person. You're putting out the bat signal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really is. I'm so into it. And I, I like, I like, I don't know about you, I really like shirts that are like inside jokes, like really small. Like if you mm -hmm. get it, you get it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. then you're like, oh, instant camaraderie. You're like, the cabbage guy. I get it. That's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sly references are, are 
yeah, a, a big thing in the nerd community. It's, it's you know, it's, it's also another one of those things that just like just like pinging the crowd of like I'm gonna say this slight thing and see who picks up. Right. You know, right. who lights up when I say you know some random X Men character's name. Right. Right. Yep, I totally agree. So, where did you grow up in California? Are you from there? I know you're there now. Uh, yeah, uh, I was born in Washington, lived oh. a year up there as a child, and then, yeah, uh, California right for now. 40 years. Nice, nice. You like it? Most, mostly mountain towns. I'm not a big city person. Yeah, same. Um, yeah, I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, it's a little rough in the Northern California area. Not everywhere is as culturally liberal as people think California is. Splotches of, of red areas yeah. in the mountains. Sure. <laughs> it, it gets a little rough from time to time. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. That's another funny thing about like a state that size. You're like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. You know you know the big ones, but there's a lot of small ones that you're like, well, just under the radar, my friend. Yeah, and that, that aesthetic of when you travel somewhere and they're, and, you know, they're like, oh, you're from California. How are the beaches? Like, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I live nowhere near beaches. <laughs> like, it's currently snowing where I live. Oh, my God. That, that's my favorite thing about California is you literally have it all. You can mm-hmm. go to the beach in the morning and then go skiing at night. Mm-hmm. It's insane. Insane. That's one of my one of my dreams is to take my motorcycle up the, the Pacific Coast Highway. Yeah. Um, just, there you go. What do you ride? Oregon. Uh, I got a 2018 uh, Kawasaki Vulcan Classic. Nice, nice. You see. I got lucky. Guy, it was a showroom model that they were trying to get rid of. And they had a huge discount on it, zero miles. Dude, I got extremely lucky. I'm super happy. Not bad, not bad. I rode a, an O2 Honda Rebel. For mm. a, I, love, I love, I love Rebels. Me too. Me. Too. It's like a Harley without the price tag. Mm-hmm. Have you? What do you think about the, the, the them getting rid of the 250s and going to the the 300s and 500s? It's crazy. It's crazy. I I like 250. I thought it was mm-hmm. I thought it was a nice little thing, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I don't know. I also I really like the bobber style. I always have. It's just my yeah. thing. Like my dad, he grew up like, like he always had a a huge road king. Mm-hmm. You know, this big guy, big beard, big rings, riding this massive Harley. So I was like, yeah, that's what that's what that's a biker. That's what you do. So then when the rebel came up, I was like, oh sweet. And he was telling me this whole big thing about like when rebels first came out, Harley sued them because they basically stole the design. And I was like, that's cool. A Harley without the Harley price. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. I like the smaller ones. But I'm also one of those people that's like, I got nothing to prove. You know? So- yeah, it was one of the things. I, I, I call them the skate pods. Yeah, there you those go. Neat, zippy little bike where you're just like, you know what? I, 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 I want to be forced to take less things with me. Yeah, there you go. You know, just as minimalist as possible. There and you just, go. Just me, the bike, and the road and just go. Yeah, there's there's a mentality you have to have when riding a motorcycle, I learned. Especially, mm-hmm. like, even when you get, like, in a car, when you're thinking, like, 35, 40 miles an hour, you're like, oh, this, it, you know, it's a car, you're fine. When you're going 35, 45 miles an hour on a bike, you feel, like, it changes around 25. Mm-hmm. Like, you're like, okay, there's, this is a lot of wind, and, like, we're we're going now. And it's like, you can't really focus on anything else as well. So it's kind of yeah. it's kind of nice. Puts you in your own little world. Mm-hmm. I was discussing with my brother the other day the concept of go fast on bike, which I am I'm not a go fast guy. Same. Same. And it's like, you know, at eighty miles an hour, the bike doesn't get squirrely, I do. Right, right. Well, cause yeah, if anything happens, I mean it's game over, buddy. There's yeah, nothing. And, yeah, you it's can one of the do. things is like I don't at that point I've got so much adrenaline pumping through me that I don't trust my reaction time. Yeah, I dude, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. When I'm on the roads, my biggest fear is other people. Mm. It's crazy, but it's it's, yeah. it's it's an interesting sort of flow state you got to be in because you're you're feeling everything under the handlebars. You got your feet where you shift in. You're like, okay, it's like this extra state of being you're in on a motorcycle. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, well, it's just like you know being aware of your surroundings while doing the dance to operate the motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's it's an interesting once you get into that zone and you're just doing it. It's a very interesting place to be, and you can dump a lot of BS out of your head. Yeah, exactly. Because one and just, thing, and you're, it's game over, buddy. Yeah. And see, and that's like my biggest fear 
riding a bike, and one of the reasons I'm such an sometimes an overly cautious rider is I don't want anybody else being responsible for like my death. Yeah, I hear you. You know, oh, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I would horrifically feel bad if somebody had to experience that. Like, I don't want to end up getting, you know, injured or, you know, getting hit and traumatizing the kid that's in the car, or the person that hit me. <laughs> like, I worry about that. <laughs> that is that. You know what? That's exactly who I pinged you for, Nix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like if somebody hits and kills me, I mean, I don't want them to think about that forever. Well, that, that, yeah, oh, that, <laughs> you know, as, as somebody, I, you know, it's, it's one of those things, like, you know, I've been a witness to horrific car accidents. Yeah. And that, you know, just, you know, really sticks with you the rest of your life. I still, 100%. It, you, know, you know, having to perform chest compressions on a guy. Oh boy! You know, after he just got hit, yeah. It's it's I if I can live my whole life and nobody ever has to do that for me, and get stuck with that mental image, yeah. It's good, that's that's a goal. It's a good goal to have. <laughs> it's I mean it is true. That's they're called traumatic experiences for a reason. They stick around. Mm hmm. Yep, my wife got hit in a, in a car accident once in like a parking lot. Somebody came in here, and every time we drive by that, she's still the the grip on the steering wheel gets a little tighter. It just that's that's how those things go. You don't just mm -hmm. like, oh, cool, we're fine now. Yeah, no, and still to this day, because what it was, it was uh, somebody just walked into a crosswalk, and the driver wasn't paying attention and Ooh. just full on hit him. Yeah. If if it even looks like somebody might step out in front of me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I I go into full on lockdown mode. Yeah, I bet. Like you know, I'll have to I have to stop the vehicle and just like compose myself. Sure. Because it just it takes you right back to that moment. It's nuts. People just need to look out. I where I live, I live in Southern Florida, and the average age of a person in the city that I live in is like sixty five. So it's like the difficulty level is turned up just a little more because they're a bunch of really old people with very slow reaction times. So mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh, that, man. That's, uh, this is a, a lot of the surrounding area around here is a retirement community. Yeah. And we have a lot of uh, elderly people driving tanks. Oh, no. <laughs> they're, they're very fond of just giant vehicles. Yeah, yeah. The old ladies in like Hummer style cars. You're like, what? Oh, what are we doing? Giant, <laughs> How do you get you in there? <laughs> Huge yeah, like suburbans. Yeah, and it's it's this it's this weird dichotomy because the uh, right Chico where I live right now is a college town, mm -hmm. so it's very much this dichotomy of older people, um, whose reaction times and stuff like that is a lot slower, and younger people who think they're invincible and they just walk out into traffic. Oh my God! Welcome to the Thunderdome. It, yeah, it's <laughs> oh, terrifying. You know, it's just you know, like it's ten o'clock at night and everybody's dressed up in black hoodies and they just walk out from between parked cars into the road. And oh, just, oh my god! Yeah, and you're riding the iron horse. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No thanks. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need that much stress in my life. <laughs> yeah. Man. So growing up, being into all the nerd stuff and things like. Were you artistic? Like, did you do a lot of art and, like, creative things back then? Like, I'm trying to find the through line here because I, I, I did a lot. Not a lot. Well, I did a lot of doodling and writing and poetry. Uh, cool, cool. Not very good at any of them specifically. <laughs> sure. But, you know, um, like, I did a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. um, what limited access I had to, like, drama classes I did. Sure. Uh, a little bit of art, uh, a lot of guitar play. Oh, cool! You're into music. A, a lot of acoustic guitar play. Yeah, just me and an old beat up guitar, just walking. That's so cool. Playing. What? So guitar was like your jam? Yeah, for the longest time. Yeah. And, That's you know, cool. I got to a point where I had to like do the adult thing. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I put it down for way too long. Um, just recently started feeling comfortable playing again. Yeah, dude, I love those videos you've been making. It's true. The the joy that you can get from four chords, it's music. It's something else. Mm-hmm. 
Uh -huh. uh, it's one of those things too. Those those videos are, are 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 really therapeutic for me, getting comfortable playing in front of people again. Because sure. I used to just you know you got that teenage bravado. Oh you, yeah. Like oh did somebody say guitar here? Let me get mine. Yeah. You know <laughs> like literally nobody said the word guitar. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say it yourself, and you're like, I said Beetlejuice, and I am Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah, and so it's. Like I, I, I just I used to just play stuff for people at the drop of a hat and just just not care and there just be go. ecstatic. And you kind of lose that after a while. Like adulthood beats beats that out of you a little bit. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And so that's me very much um, reasserting my my extrovert. There you go. So what what was your what was your job? What did you do when you're like I need to do this adult thing? What path did you take? Oh, well, I got a job at, uh, after high school, I bounced around a lot, mm -hmm. back to this, that, and the other. But I got a job at the local newspaper. What? Dude, Yeah, I do newspapers. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, I was in insertion distribution back in the, uh, back in the old mail room. Uh, no put, way. Putting inserts into the machine and spitting out bundles to the carriers. There you go. I'm a carrier. Nice, nice. Yeah, dude. Oh, uh, carrier story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lordy Lord. Oh yeah, that's. Yeah, so I did that for ten years. I ended up becoming uh, the 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 foreman. Nice, nice. Uh, ran ran the entire department. There you go. Uh, it was it was it was fun. You know, overnight shifts. Yep. Um, we had what we had a a couple of old Mueller Martini 227 inserting machines for years, and then we upgraded to um, a Harris 1372, just a big circular inserter, just a big beast of a machine. There you go. So I you know, I did a lot of machine work and learned how that stuff works. And oh, that's cool. Working directly with a lot of the carriers. Like, I don't know how it is where you're is, but I had, I've had i had guns pulled on me, yep. knives pulled on me. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. One lady had a mobile meth lab in her van. Yeah. Um, There's mm -hmm. a few uh, attempted rapes. Um, yeah. I got slapped by an older gentleman with a flipper. <laughs> yep. It's an interesting breed of people that do this job. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've been I've been a carrier for this July will be 11 years. Mm. And uh, yeah, we so we would be there's the plant. That does, you know, your job, and then mm -hmm. they would put them in the trucks, and then they would take them to a shop where I'm at with like six other people, and we all had our own routes, and we did like okay. we didn't do home deliveries, we did like big bulk orders to stores. Oh, okay. So that's like our big thing, but yeah. We, I was, <laughs> so how often did this press break down? Oh lord! <laughs> <laughs> all the damn time. Yep. 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 <laughs> It was it very much, I, my job was ex exactly the way they described war. Yeah. It was vast stretches of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer fucking terror. Yeah. <laughs> and if it wasn't the press, then it was my inserting machine that would just, parts would fly off of it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to talk to someone who gets this line of work because it's so specific. It's also mm -hmm. really funny, like, when I tell anyone what I do, I'm like, oh, I, I deliver newspapers. The Nine out of ten times, the next thing is, oh, yeah, I did that as a kid. I was like, sir, yeah. impossible. <laughs> like, I want to yeah, no. see the bike you were riding that had 2,000 papers on it in bundles. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bonkers. I mean, like, it, and then you would have just, like, newspaper cartels. Yes. Where it's like one carrier would sign up for 7,000 papers and then have, like, six subcontractors. Yep. Yep. And that's so weird. It's dude, there's like this underworld of like the newspaper b carrier business. It's so nuts. I always said if I ever tried to do stand up, I was like, I would just talk about my job. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> you, the but, the type of people is insane. Mm hmm The behind the scenes of the newspaper industry and deliveries and all of that is just what the hell yeah. is going in just absolute chaos. Oh yeah, oh and yeah, and just the, the the weirdest array of people that's ever been slapped together. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. People you don't believe exist, one hundred percent, are in the newspaper business. Oh man, it's so and it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's just we we had a guy one time who had like 
one of this it was like an old like sedan like almost like the the kinds that had like wood paneling on the side mm-hmm. and then he was like uh he's like so i i come up with an upgrade and he opened it up and he had a lit candle in his cup holder and he's like yeah because you know my car like i, I just wanted to smell nice i was like dude they they have air fresheners you could put you could put on you the have open flame around yeah. all of this yeah. fuel news print yep yeah, I was like, that's a good idea. And then he had a tiny trailer that he put on the back of it. So imagine just this regular old, like, family car with a lit candle in the front and then a trailer in the back that's open air. There's no – I was like, what is uh, – all right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just <laughs> – it's nobody, – nobody understands what goes through those presses and in those shops – that hasn't lived through it. It's bonkers. Yeah, and I did a decade. Yeah, yeah, I, I just like, did a decade. It's I, like I've seen it all. Yep, yep. You know, forklift racing on the weekends when nobody was looking. Yep, yep. You know, just absolute pandemonium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crazy, crazy times. A lot of it, obviously, we can't legally talk about, but you get it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, and, and it was a fun thing too. Is like a lot of the, some of that time too is very much I describe as like my Vietnam. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like when you literally have carriers that are so adamant that their papers are coming out next that they pull a gun on you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's I, nuts over newspaper. Over newspaper, it's insane, and yeah. you just like all you can do is just like really this is my life now. I know, over a newspaper. Yeah, yep, I'm yeah. with you. Did you? Do and then the fact, the fact that like the upper echelon in the circulations department want, don't want to do down routes so bad that they're just like, oh, we didn't see a gun on the camera. Yeah, isn't that weird? Like they let yeah. there's so much because nobody wants to do the job because it's every night, so mm-hmm. it's tough to find someone who wants to go for it, and then to keep them, you're like, uh, I didn't see that. Like you know, it's crazy. It's mm-hmm. cra- crazy. Did you like working overnights? Um, for the most part, it got tougher when I got into management when they would make me stay until the day shift to go to meetings that I didn't need to go to. Ooh, that sucks. Yeah, and I'm you know salaried employee. Oh, uh, yep. It's yep. just like I could either I could go home for an hour, or I could just sleep in my office until you know nine o'clock in the morning, and then go to this Sheesh. meeting. Ooh. That literally nothing concerning my department is going to be brought up. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I find I find that I really I like working nights a lot. Definitely because I've been doing it for so long. But mm-hmm. then you know you got your days free to do all of that, and like I'm an actor during the day as well, so I can like take acting gigs and go on auditions and stuff during the day while working every night. But mm-hmm. I also not in management, and sure as hell wasn't working until nine in the morning. That's crazy. What, yeah, time, what I, time did you start? I, uh, four. PM. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> Why did you do this job? <laughs> I, I'm, well, that's the thing. It's just like, you know, you're a 20 some year old guy that's just, everybody's told you, like, you work. Yeah. This is what men do. And, like, that's about the time I got married. Oh, you know, yeah. And I ended up with, married with five stepkids. There you go. Why not? Jump and, off the deep uh, end. Um, I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I got to do this, like, adult thing. And so I just, like, I'll just go ahead and take 20 pounds of responsibility. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is what we do? This is where the yoke goes? Okay. Yeah. And so I just <laughs> jumped in a whole hog and just nose to the grindstone. And I'm always one of those, been one of those people that's just like, when you do a job, you do it. Yep. Yep. I'm you saying. Know? And so I just ended up, you know, being put in charge of things. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> sure, I can totally do that. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but you seem to be fairly confident, so okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Just pretend you know what you're doing, and everyone else will be like, oh, confidence. All right. Yeah. Oh, man. 4 p.m.? Yeah, I, I did a lot of, uh, well, that was, I did a, a lot of 24 hour shifts. Good Lord. You're making me appreciate just- my job more. Oh, yeah, where it's just like I'd have to do, 
run the paper at night, but then during the day, my day crew would be without a supervisor. So I'd have to, you know, sleep a couple hours in the elevator control room on a pile of cardboard and then get up and run the day shift too. Sheesh, man. That see, that's when salary comes to get you. You know. Oh, like, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. You, you want salary for the money, but then when you start adding up them hours, ooh, mm-hmm. ooh, yeah. I, 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 you've reinvigorated me because I feel so much better. Because as a carrier, I don't start till I start at like midnight is when I get to the shop, and then we have mm-hmm. multiple trucks come, and then we put those together, and then I'm done. It's season right now, so I'm done between like five and six on a late night, depending on when the trucks get there. Yeah. So here in your schedule, I'm like, wow, I got it on Easy Street, man. Yeah. So that thank was... you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those were some formative years, and and what's funny is after that, every other job was just like, all right. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> like yeah. this is all gravy. Yeah. Yep. Same. Do you have really rough hands now? Because I sure do. Mm-hmm. Yep, tie-in bundles and everything. I was like, I have the. My, I, there was one time my my wife was like, "Should you wear gloves?" I was like, "No, because you can't tie the twine and do the thing with gloves." And she's like, "Maybe you put like lotion on your hands." I was like, "It's not gonna work because I'm gonna do it every night." So we just had to deal with. She's holding hands with a gargoyle from now on. I was yeah, like, just how it works. And that's the thing that newsprint just sucks every ounce of moisture out of you. It does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> we always joke that like the. Because I've been doing it for, yeah, this July will be 11 years. My parents did it before me because I took over my dad's route when he retired. And mm-hmm. uh, we always joke that the reason people do it for so long is because you get addicted to the ink. So yeah. It's like you got to keep coming back every night for your fix. Mm-hmm. It's so funny. My goodness. So then when did, so when did you start like etching glass then? Because that seems like such a random thing to just start. I was apprenticed by a friend of the family in high school. Oh, that's cool. Um, doing, uh, she primarily did stained glass and a little bit of glass etching. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't take to the stained glass, but I, I very much was like, oh, this is cool. And I fiddled farted around with it for um, a little bit. It was never really anything major. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after I got laid off from the newspaper, I was like, I, one of those situations where you're like, I don't want to have to work that hard for anybody else. <laughs> yep. yep. That, that was 10 years of bullshit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just to be unceremoniously like, well, bye. Yeah. Oh, you know? That sucks. And uh, so I took what little I had and I just, you know, invested it in what I needed. Hell yeah. And it was when I started, I was literally taking – designs and pictures that were printed out or in art books and I was you tracing them on a light table onto clear vinyl to make my stencils and resist mm-hmm. and like I realized quickly I was like there there's there's absolutely no way I'm going to be able to make any money doing this yeah <laughs> like there's no repeatability to 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 any of these images it's just right it's it's just this whole process so I I started playing around with uh photoshop and just printing onto sticky vinyl like the contact shelf paper mm-hmm. i would cut it into eight and a half by 11 sheets and i printed uh my images on that in uh, like a grayscale so the ink wouldn't smudge oh and i put clear contact paper over it and make a decal and i could stick that to the glass and then cut it out by hand with an exacto knife Ah, okay. And that's still just a giant t- and just just horribly tedious process. Yeah, you can't do that fast. Cause yeah, this this because this was long before the age of like tabletop vinyl cutters. Yeah, you know, Crick Cut wasn't a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and so I spent got eight, seven, eight years you know, working part-time jobs, this, that, and the other, and doing this in my garage, and just, I've, I've literally cut by hand thousands and thousands of individual pieces. Oh, man. Nuts. And uh, and then individually putting each one through, because I etch with a sandblaster. Right. You know, and so, like, when, I, I just finally got a, a, a vinyl cutter last year. There you go. <laughs> Moving I up. Started, I started in 2010, 
I just finally got a vinyl cutter. And, oh, Lord. It, yeah. Are you zooming? <laughs> it, it doesn't get the finer detail of, like, my really, really custom one-off pieces. I still have to do those by hand. Mm-hmm. But uh, for my more commercial pieces that are just super cookie cutter, yeah, um, it does those great. And it also allows me to lower my price a little bit just, you know, because it's not all super custom handmade. Sure. So it, you know, it, it, it makes it so I can get it to people easier. People can afford my work. Yeah, yeah. Because if it you doesn't know, and, sell, and it's, you're not making it. And nothing. doing those custom pieces is still, I, I get to still get to scratch that itch. Yeah. That's cool. So was was it something like you took to it? But was it something that like there was a learning curve? Like you had to practice and practice to get good at it, and like it just se- it um, seems so difficult from an outsider's perspective. It's really not too bad. Yeah. When you first start, if you, I mean, it's literally just tracing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the hardest part is just keeping your hands steady. If you have a nice straight, like you have a nice pint glass that's got nice straight edges to it. Yeah. Um, you literally, you just trace the design onto some sticky paper or some sticky vinyl and just put it on there and cut out what you want to be etched with, with a hobby knife. Oh. You know, as, as long as you can keep the line pretty straight, it's easy. Gotcha. Okay. It's like but you got to you, take your time. Yeah. But once you start getting into like glass with more of a compound curve to it, Mm-hmm. then it becomes increasingly difficult to get your stencil to adhere to it. Oh, uh, okay. Because it wants to warp and bubble and fold in weird places, so you have to use heat to kind of just make it a little more malleable and stick to it. It's a giant pain in the butt. Sure. And then once you start getting into like finer detail, that's when you have to be really, really careful and meticulous with uh, your cutting. Because mm-hmm. there are times that I'm cutting away vinyl and leaving pieces that are literally like a hair's width behind. Oh. Like you have to be very slow and meticulous and take your time. And then not only while cutting it, but while handling it too. Because you can, I've accidentally grabbed it wrong and just smudged half my stencil away. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh. So it, you know. The more detailed the, the image, you know, the more complicated. And then once you get into the, like the digitally making your um, stencils, I mean, it, it gets a lot more fun because you can get a lot more cool stuff, but it takes a lot more skill to make. Um, I do a lot of custom pieces where people will send me a photo and I'll turn a photo into a stencil and etch it onto a piece. Oh, wow. Um, I, I have a thing on Twitter where if I'm just scrolling around, if I see that somebody has posted that a pet has died, I'll jump in and I do a pet memorial uh, pro bono. That's so cool. Um, I just tell them, send me the best picture you got of your pet and I'll put it on. What Generally what I put it on is like a candle holder. Nice. So how, so how exactly does this work then? You get a picture, you print it out? Like what's the, what's the process here? Break this down for me. Um, say I'm going to do, um, uh, uh, any kind of image, I'll just create it digitally. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm going to hand cut it, I then print it onto, uh, sticky back vinyl and make a decal out of it. Okay. I put it on the glass and I cut out what I want to be etched. Okay. And then the rest of the glass, I cover it with masking tape so that I don't accidentally over etch. Mm-hmm. And I then put it in the sand blaster and I use aluminum oxide powder instead of sand to kind of reduce the amount of sil- free floating silicates. Cool. Smart. Because even though I wear a hardcore respirator, like silicosis is horrific. Right. Right. Better safe um, than sorry. Yeah. The lady that actually apprenticed me um, doing glass uh, work, actually uh, died of, like, lung cancer complications. Oh, no. She, she, she never wore PPE. Oh, no. Yeah. That's and so I'm nuts. very, very hardcore about my PPE. As you should be. And you have a personal um, real-life example. Yeah. Sheesh. And, and then basically what you do is you just you hit it with, you know, semi-high-pressure dust, and it's just controlled scratching. 
That's cool. So the the I, marks that you make, like, kind of warms it up for this process of it being scratched by this stuff. No, what it does is just it. What I cut away reveals where I want the scratching to be and the shape I want it to be in. Oh, okay. You're think pretty it, much setting the parameters before. Yeah, think of it as think of it as spray painting a, with a stencil, except for you're actually eating into the glass. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That's pretty cool. And then depending on how high your pressure is, what kind of a blast medium you're using, and how long you etch the item, mm -hmm. you can vary the depth. Oh, wow. You know, um, I do a lot of coffee, uh, ceramic coffee cups, and I actually eat through the, the, the enamel on the outside, the, 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 the colored coating, Yeah. to the, the white ceramic underneath. So I got to eat pretty deep into it. Wow. That's neat. Yeah, I never realized that. Because, you know, watching like a video of you doing this, for somebody that doesn't know what we're looking at, it looks like you're like doing the thing with your hand, but you're setting the parameters to blast this thing, and then it blasts in the shape that you've cut out. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm getting it. And it's one of those things, you know, it, depending on how steady of a hand and how good of an eye you have, anybody can glass etch. It's just at what detail level can they are can they? Right, because if there's a mistake when you pull yeah, that thing out, you're like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, there's. <laughs> Has it happened a lot? Oh yeah, yeah. Just like I forgot to, I forgot to cover one tiny little piece, and I accidentally overblasted. So now there's this glaring scratch where there shouldn't be one. Oh no. Um, the vinyl wasn't sticking right when I went to hit it with the high pressure blast. It just blast blew chunks of the vinyl off. Oh no. Um, I've had where I've meticulously cut a piece, taken me, you know, a week to cut a design. Whoa. Um, got it masked, put it in the blaster, got it blasted, peeled away the resist, it looks good, washed it, signed at the bottom, set it on my workbench, turned around to grab my soda, turned back around, knocked it off the workbench, and oh, shattered Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, how many things have you broken? Oh, uh, a thousand. Gotta be, gotta be, right? Some of them accidental, some of them extremely intentional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the sound of breaking glass is sometimes very cathartic. Yeah. Do you have one of those like areas? What are the, it's like a rage room, they call oh, it. Oh, <laughs> I, very, I very much have breaking glass that I keep on hand. There you go. There you go. I'm yeah. tired of this. It's, yeah. It's very satisfying. Mm hmm Yeah. That's crazy. Man. So has have you has there ever been a piece that has been destroyed while in the blasting process? Uh, not broken, but um, I've had the, the the image get screwed up due to, like, the resist coming loose or, you know, accidentally not masking it off completely. I've, I've ruined the image. Sure, sure. Man. And you're working with glass. So how often have you cut your hand on a piece before as opposed to, like, cutting your hand with your knife? Um, not really with a piece, uh -huh. um, with my hobby knife. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, there's been, you, you know, you, you know, that instinct you have when you're sitting down writing or whatever, and you drop your pen and you try to do that, and catch it with your thigh thing. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Like, I've really had to train myself not to do that with a, with a hobby knife. Cause <laughs> I've harpooned my own thigh more times than I care to admit. Oh no. <laughs> It's yeah. Like if the newspapers didn't cut your hands up enough, well. <laughs> yeah, it's just I've had those situations where I've just like I've been intently focused on cutting something, and I fumbled the exacto knife, and I like I it just lawn darted my thigh. Oh no! And I'm just standing there like that scene from Ace Ventura too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like an exacto knife sticking out of my upper thigh. Oh my! I mean, at least you caught it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've flipped a hundred times and cut my fingers, or I have a bad habit of um, I get vinyl stuck to the end of the blade, and I tend to flick it like you would a cigarette. Oh yeah, and I run my finger along the blade in a flicking motion, and, and, or along the flat of the blade. Oh, oh no. but it's in the in the pullback sometimes. Like I catch the tip of it. Yeah, with the tip of my finger, and I've had it go to the bone before. Ooh, 
Just yeah. enough to remind you how fragile humans are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised I have nerve endings left in my fingers. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And you're still making art. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how many times it's tried to kill me. Yeah, exactly. This is a, this is the other side of the service that you provide, you know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Is there is there, like, a a piece that's more difficult to work with, like a cup or a stein or tokens or something like that? Um, wine glasses. Ooh. Anything, anything with a compound curve. Yeah. It, it's rough to get larger designs, especially to wrap around a wine glass and get it to lay nice and even to cut that design. Right. That makes sense. You know, you got to do a lot of little tiny relief cuts you know, use a little bit of heat, make the vinyl malleable. Right. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a huge process that's kind of annoying. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, and that's why that, right now I <clears throat> I design a lot of my designs. Like this is going to be specifically for a wine glass because you have just like a, for the compound curves, you've got a narrow avenue mm-hmm. of either horizontally or vertically of maybe like, I don't know, maybe an inch or so. Right. That if it's just going like straight up and down or straight side to side, that it'll lay nice and flat, no fuss, no muss. But if you start going past that parameter and getting bigger, then it gets into the, you got to deal with the, the majority of the curve. So I, I like, I'm just going to do this little strip design because it, it yeah. won't. Wow. And, uh, and also wine glasses, I imagine, because they're so fragile as well. It's like mm-hmm. you got to, it's, it's, you gotta be so careful. Mm-hmm. What's the most difficult design you've done so far? Most difficult design I've done so far? Yeah. Um, I did. I've done a few pieces. Um, I did. Well, anytime I do a portrait, it's a giant pain in the butt. Oh, I bet. Just to get the to turn it into a black white stencil, but still retain as much detail as possible. Mm-hmm. Um. See, somebody once ordered a three-piece set of Jean-Claude Van Damme from Bloodsport. <laughs> <laughs> I love the specificity. Like, listen, yeah, you know what right. I need etched in glass? I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> are you familiar with the artist Tess Fowler? Yeah. Um, I did, I originally she did a tweet about how much she had recently come to enjoy scotch. And nice. then she did a tweet about, um, one of the characters from her then running comic book. I think it's the run is finished. Um, and it was just a, a one panel from the comic and it just, she just the tweet caption said, my good sweet son. I was like, you know what? I took that and I etched it onto a scotch glass for her. Nice. So, you know, it would have that nice double meaning of, I just, here, here's a gift. I know you enjoy scotch and, you know, your art's awesome. And she loved it so much, she commissioned me to do two more pieces. Nice. Um, of characters from the same comic book on giant 25 ounce mugs. And they were so spectacularly, horrifically detailed. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like- just like. I'm so excited at how much this is going to suck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a gift, not a challenge. <laughs> yeah, but oh, man. Um, and then um, Swordsfall won on Twitter. I absolutely love the art for their RPG. Uh-huh. Uh, their artist, Tumo, I believe is the name. Um, that I was just like, I found one piece of art that was just like, I really really want to see if I could do this. And I, I threw that on a, uh, what do they call them? Uh, they're very, um, I forget what the Scandinavian mug. There's a, a yeah. larger mug, real thick, and it's got a nice uh, inward curve to it. Mm-hmm. And I threw it on one of those, and it came out absolutely beautifully, and I sent it to, to Brandon at Swordsfall. There you go. And, um. I've been trying to do more commission pieces. Uh, I did one for my wife, trying to get her into gaming. Um, I sh- sat down with her, and, and we made her a character. Oh, cool. Like a, a halfling rogue. And then I took a picture of her, threw it on Photoshop, and gave it some halfling features. 
Oh, cool. And altered her clothing and this, that, and the other, and and made her a uh, character mug Dude. from her picture. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. What a great idea. So what what's the longest time you've spent on One Piece? Is it a week? Oh, no. I've spent uh, a month and a half. Really? Doing, yeah, some, some larger detailed pieces. Wow. That's a long time. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you didn't break it at the end because oh, yeah. I don't think you would have recovered, and rightfully so. Yeah. And see, and that's the thing that's hard is I love doing those pieces, but it's one of those things where it's like it's not something you can make a living off of because if right. I were to charge, like, some type of hourly rate, then nobody paying a thousand bucks for a mug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That is true. That is true. Yeah. So it's one of those things is those jobs are few and far between. Um, yeah. And I do them primarily because I love doing them. Sure. Which I think is important for an artist because if you don't, it comes through. It's like food. Like if somebody loves food, their cooking mm-hmm. is usually really good. Mm-hmm. You know, versus somebody like the technical side of it. It's like you can taste it. It's a weird It's a weird thing how that's like transferred through the art. So what what tools are required for this sort of job? For this, really, all you need is some just some sticky back vinyl, mm-hmm. um, a sharpie marker, a hobby knife, and a, a sandblaster. Sure, that's cool. Some way, some way to propel some sort sort of black medium. Right. Um, you can use etching etching creams and whatnot. I'm not a big fan. Mm-hmm. I've tried them. Sure. I, I I find them to be less than effective for what I like to do. Right. But like if somebody lived in an apartment and they didn't want and they didn't have access to somewhere to put a big old sandblaster and air compressor, right. um, they can go down to Michael's and, and pick up a, a jar of what is that armor etch etching cream. You just make a simple stencil and stick it to glass and goop that on there and let it sit. Oh, okay. Okay. What is it about etching then that like like why etching? I don't know, I really like I've always been a huge fan of iconography. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Stuff like that. And I've always loved making baubles, mm-hmm. like goblets with weird inscriptions on them and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so it was one of those things that very much allowed me to just like make cool things, shiny things. Yeah, yeah, it just, it just clicks with you? Mm-hmm. That's cool. And like I said, like, I, I really like iconography for some reason. Right. Yeah, I'm with you. Know, you. Just, the identifiers. I have runes and weird symbols and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same. I'm the same. It's just, it's something, I don't know. We're just wired that way. It's like, I know that, I know what a D20 is and it makes me feel yeah. good when I look at it. I like that. And it's, and I, it's fun too, because I, I like incorporating some of the, like the ancient iconographies and stuff like that with, with nerdy gaming shit. Yeah. You know, I just recently did a, threw out a design for a, a like a Thor's hammer, like a Mjolnir decal that's just got all kinds of knot work on it. And then there's like a big D20 right in the middle of it. Yeah. Because so... why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> I love that. When you mesh the creative things together, it's just cool. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fun too. Is you just like, you look at this stuff from our history and you're just like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Why what not? If, what, what if I made it nerdier? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is always a good question to ask. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's one of those things. I look at designs. I'm like, yes, that's great. But what if we put a D20 in the middle of it? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I, I subscribe to that. You know, you get into the situations where it's very much like a, sir, this is, this is an Arby's. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your enthusiasm, sir, but no. Yeah, there you go. You carry a D20 in your pocket. When they give you your sandwich, you just put it on top. You're like, that's about right. That's yeah. about right. And now it's better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a D20 does make everything better. It's a fact. Yeah. Unless you roll a one, then it's the worst thing ever invented. <laughs> <laughs> but, dude, we've been talking for an hour already. Look at that. Jeez. We did it. So, before I let you go, i got to ask you, where can people find you online? And please plug your Etsy store. Okay. Um, online, I do, I'm do. i most active on Twitter, and that's at MC underscore etching. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a janky website that I use primarily as a dumping spot for photos. It's just more of a gallery than anything. There you go. And, and that's mcetching.com. I like it. And then uh, my Etsy store is just uh, etsy.com slash shop slash mcetching. Mcetching. 
I like it for all your glass etching needs. And do you, <laughs> you still do commissions and stuff like that? Yep. Sweet. Sweet. Check it out. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.